Oh, yes. Fired up on behalf of 76, our founding partner. We've got Guy Haberman, my partner. Partner. Yeah, partner. Partner. Oh, God. We've done so many of these episodes already, man. You've done a ton of podcasting. Check it all out at Guy's social handles. We'll, we'll make sure that is all in the show notes. But, Guy, uh, I'm really excited about this conversation because we have done games before. We have told people on the internet that we are a crew this year alongside the ever good looking and talented Rhett Lewis. Uh, I just wanted to have you on to, to learn a little bit more about you in real time. Cause why not? Cause you go to your website and it says, is guy your real name? And just, yes, that's all the bio that we have at, at guy. It's all the bio I care to write. It's a lot. I'm not a writer. I love it, man. I'm but I'm you. just, Oh, that, that's a good thing. Cause you do a lot of things that I have no shot at doing. Uh, but we get to hang out this weekend. It's our first game in Austin. And then away we go. We got SC, we got Nebraska and, and a bunch of memories that we'll create this year, a bunch we've already created. But I, I just wanted to, to have you on to talk about you, your story, our crew, give a little context to those that will be tuning into the Big Ten Network. So thank you, my man. Thank yeah, you. I just made dinner reservations for Friday night, actually. So oh, where are we going? Dinner. Beth Beth and Gianni's, of course. Nailed it. Nailed yeah. it. Okay, so let, let's start at the beginning because I'm a linear thinker and, and I love that way because that's the way games go. I, I want to hear from you because I, I don't know all this story, but I'm curious, like, when did it begin for you that you wanted to do what you've now began to call a career over the last, what, 15 years? You've been either calling games. We met when you were in the radio. Yeah, 20 uh, years. 20 years. Okay, we're all getting a little older, man. Uh, how did it start? How would you get into it? Uh, I'm from Davis, California, Northern California, small town, college town, UC Davis, Chris Peterson, Nick Eliotti, Dan Hawkins. Um, and, uh, I didn't go to UC Davis, but, uh, when I was in high school in Davis, uh, my dad said one summer, like, uh, maybe it was in the fall. He's like, you know, you got to get a job or do something, whatever, you know? And, uh, so I called up, I'd always like done my own little radio shows and do a tape recorder for which my mom once paid me to stop. She once paid me a dollar to be quiet for 30 minutes. We we're all staying in one hotel room. But uh, so I called the local TV, the local community. I brought up all that up about Davis being small because they had like local community television. And somebody's dad would film the football games on Friday night and then they would air on Wednesdays. And I called and said, hey, you know, you don't have any audio. Could I be the broadcaster for those games? And they said, actually, yeah, we just got some new equipment. So we're going to have three cameras instead of one. And yeah, you can definitely do it. So uh, that's that's how it started. And and okay, first clarify, like, were you hitting play and record at the same time on like a little tape recorder when you were recording yourself, or, or was it way more? Yeah, I would than... like call local sports talk stations and record the call. Come or, on, um, I don't even know. I don't really. I don't really have a memory of. I don't have really clear memories of doing it, but I, the tapes exist somewhere. Um, <laughs> Where did you get but the courage I, to do that? I, into a tape recorder? No, even when when you'd call or come up with the idea, like I, I think a big challenge is getting to know your voice, yeah, and then gaining mastery around it. And it's awkward for a lot of us, me included, when I got going. But there you were right. as a youngster saying, like, "Yeah, I like this thing." Well, it wasn't my voice, you know, right? I mean, it was what I thought maybe I should sound like. Um, if you listen to some of that stuff, like or even the stuff when I got to college, when I got to college, my first year, my first week at Fresno state, I just went to the student radio station and said, same thing. Like, do you have anything I can do? And they had some volleyball games on radio and some softball games. So I was doing that. Um, but it wasn't anything that I look back on it now. And I give, you know, credit to the people that encouraged me to keep going or told me I was good. Cause it's not good. I mean, objectively it's bad. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I guess it, I think it probably came from knowing I should do something and not having any better ideas. <laughs> what do you think really? led you to continue doing it, continue showing up and exploring opportunities? Just feeling like I was probably feedback, like feedback from people who know you're not good enough yet, but maybe say, if you keep going, you could probably get there. So I would say that was, that's a big thing, right? It's feeling like, Oh, I'm doing it and I feel like I'm getting better. And people who I think are good at it are saying, like, yeah, you got something here. I can remember, you know, specific examples of people saying to me that. Like, or, what? like what's one of the first core ones where you're like, okay, well, I mean, I, the, I might the, actually have this. The first thing I was just, I was doing softball games on the student radio station and the commercial radio station needed somebody and they called. 
And I thought, oh, they might, good, okay. So they they need somebody and they think I'm good. Now, I mean, fundamentally, like in hindsight, they just needed truly anybody. And I was already there doing it. So it probably wasn't the grand vote of confidence that, that it felt like it was, but that's what it felt like it was, you know. Um, they could have hired one of their own people or something. I don't know. Um, so, you know, that would be one. That was definitely, that was the early one. But even the 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 guy who hired me at the student radio station was a very savvy um, person. And he was really good with feedback and coaching, which, as you know, as anybody knows, it's when you have a, a boss or or a mentor or anybody that is willing to give you honest feed, there's not, a, there's a lot of, and even in our business, there's a lot of, hey, good stuff, guys, great show, without any real, you know, feedback. So I was lucky to have real, you need that. You need, people are afraid to hurt your feelings or discourage you or whatever. And it takes yeah, I, time, right? It takes time. Like I tell young people, I get play by play or whoever, like pipe, whatever, people reach out to me. Could you, could you watch this or whatever? And the thing that took me a long time to figure out that I tell to them is, if you ask a specific question, then you're more likely to get a specific answer as opposed to watch this. What do you think? Cause I give a lot of the same feedback and it's authentic that I got, which is, Hey, you sound good. Keep at it. Like you need reps, keep going, which is true. It's a hundred percent true. But if you ask a specific question, how did you think I did? And what would you have said in this spot? You know, then you get a specific answer, but ready, set, use French fries to go. Yeah. Oil from French fries. Turn yesterday's leftovers into today's fuel. More power, lower emissions. 76 renewable diesel fuels all the ways you go, go, go. I've, I'm always amazed by people that are play-by-play -play and or radio hosts because of your vast knowledge of sport. Uh, you know, I'd imagine you... Sport? You, sport, yeah, just the concept of sport, right? Whether it's um, competing, whether it's a team sport, individual sport, like I just think there's a beauty to that. Yeah. So, so for you, like what, what did you play growing up or what did you lean into... Like what, what kept you coming back to the TV or coming back to the uh, radio? Was it a sport or just was it the idea of broadcasting, competing, teamwork? What was it? It was, no, it was playing a hundred percent. Like yeah, playing baseball, playing basketball. I loved watching. I played a little bit of football. I loved watching football. Um, but I, baseball was the first thing I loved for sure. I was, I thought. I truly, I thought I was going to USC to play baseball. And then my high school baseball coach was like, you're not even really playing baseball here. <laughs> now they were good. They won a section championship, but it was, um, so, and I, you know, a thousand jump shots, like a thousand, a thousand a week. I was, I was shooting before school, after school, at school. So it was just playing. I just loved playing sports. I, you know, I, I watched games. I listened to games. My dad was in the Air Force, so we moved around a lot. So when we lived abroad in Turkey, I was cutting out box scores because they I didn't have – we had some games. We'd get like Monday Night Football and I the Super Bowl. I always – as a chubby kid, man, it was a can of Sunkist, a tower of Pringles, and the Super Bowl <laughs> kicked off at like 3 a.m. I was like, that's – that was me, right? Monday Night Football, I was waking up early to watch the end of Monday Night Football before school. So it was just games. I loved, I loved. Wow. So where did games. you live? I, where did you live growing up? Like, what's the what's the trajectory? Yeah, well, I was born in Israel, not Air Force related. That's where my mom's from. So my dad was my dad was there working. His mom's from there. And then he went to school. Um, at, uh, he'd gone to Maryland, and then he went to University of Maryland Dental School. Then we lived in Omaha. I'll, I'll cruise through. Um, my parents were just here this weekend. They, they they found the house that we lived in 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 Omaha. It's on the way from the Omaha airport to Lincoln when we're there week three. So I make. We're going 100. percent Yeah. Hey. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, you guys watch BTN this weekend? You gonna watch? <laughs> um, then we lived in Arizona, Luke Air Force Base, Arizona, Indrilik Air Force Base in Turkey, uh, uh, Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, and then. Um, Travis Air Force Base in just out Vacaville, Northern California. So that's where you wow. went to Davis. What do you uh, think just all those, my freshman year? Yeah. Look, so what do you think all those experiences? Because because you're kind of describing, you know, obviously your life, but also the life of coaches' kids to a degree, or those who also serve in the military and, and their families. How do you think it impacted you when you look back on it now? 
It was awesome. I, you know, I feel like it was the best possible combination for me and that by the time we moved and settled, I was about to start my freshman year of high school. So I had that, I had one, you know, that was consistent and my parents still live in Davis. Um, but it was being dropped into a new school every two years was, you know, it's a great, a learning experience. Um, having new neighbors every two years and the, and they were people that for the most part, I was going to schools that were military kids. Not always San Antonio. I didn't, but for the most part, you know, you were kind of, especially the younger years. Um, and then an appreciation, like moving is one thing living in a developing nation when you walk off the air force base and injure like Turkey and a meal. I can remember we were there when I was like nine. And at that point in time, I was mowing the lawn for $2 a week. So I knew I had some sense of like how much a pack, you know, and then I'd go buy baseball cards. So I understood like what kind of stuff cost. And I just remember the first night we were there, we went off the air force base for dinner. Five of us. I remember dinner was like $7 and 35 cents. And I was like, I don't think that's, that's crazy, right? Like, that's insane. And kids would come up and offer to watch your car for a nickel. You know, they'd go up to the whoever got out of the driver's seat, like, watch your car, watch your car for a nickel. That's an eye-opening. I mean, that's, I don't even know how you put, how I could put in the context of value of an experience like that, right? Okay, it doesn't so mean like, oh, I always have great perspective. I'm not saying that. But it just is, especially when you're young, to see that and understand my life is not, everybody's experience is pretty useful, pretty, yeah. pretty valuable. That's a, that's an incredible story. And thank you for sharing it. And in the perspective side, I want to lean into of like your job as a play by play individual, uh, as the guy who's describing what is happening to millions at home is to offer perspective. How do you think if you, if you kind of took a red thread from that moment and you're seeing, okay, this is how much dinner is. This is you know a nickel to watch your car to now, standing in the booth on Saturday night, do you think there's a correlation in terms of how you view the world and how you view your craft? I don't know. I mean, it's probably hard to separate like on a deep level, all those experiences and what they, you know, what they create. Um, I think I appreciate, for me, I, I feel like I appreciate what every individual athlete just knowing how competitive and anybody who's in, and most people are in some competitive industry, knowing how valuable every rep feels to you. I think it's probably more that for me when I, you know, go to a practice or do a game or whatever. Um, and really feeling from like my years of doing minor league baseball, when the only people listening are the parents or the family members I did triple a baseball for three years. And if you said something about a player that was wrong, or uh, they would know about it when you went down to the batting cage the next day, because it's only their family that's <laughs> listening and they really care, you know, to th th there's not seven articles being written about Yogi Roth, the right fielder, it's just, it's that, that's it. That's all they get. Um, so like the experience of doing minor league baseball and doing, uh, I did the A's pre and post game show for a few years. And so like walking to, every day, I'm going to be in the clubhouse the next day. So whatever I said on the post game show, I have to be ready to defend. Or if I'm calling a game and I say somebody, whatever, like should have, he should have had that ball in the fourth, right? Like he's going to say something to me the next day at the batting cage. That's a really valuable uh, experience doing arena. There was a, I don't know if you even know this existed. There used to be, you know, about the arena league yokes. Sure do. Yeah. Do you know about Arena Two? Scranton had a team. Then when I grew up, Scranton Wilkesbury. Yeah, no, Wil sure did. is that is that a place? Wilkesbury. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, Scranton Wilkesbury. Yeah. Oh B A R R E. Yeah. Yeah. Scranton Wilkesbury. We went there. They had a squad. I did Arena Two football, where I made two hundred bucks a week, and that was more than the players made. <laughs> right. These were guys like you talk about chasing dreams, like chasing dreams, right? Like long shot dreams, dreams that people are telling them, like, what are you doing? driving in this minivan, the trainer is driving one and Fred Bolitnikoff Jr. The coach is driving the other one. That's the squad. <laughs> you guys are on different flights. Like what is going on? Like seeing guys that dedicated to the dream. I would say that probably is more front of mind 
in terms of doing a game and like just wanted to make sure I say somebody's name right. Mm. I have an easier time connecting those dots than the childhood thing, but yeah, I mean, I guess it's probably just a, you try to have a respect and appreciation for everybody's role. I mean, that's for sure. You know, yeah, everybody's no, chasing you, something. I mean, a huge part of even like why I have this ball behind me is like, it's just a great daily reminder that we don't exist without the ball, without the players, without the coaches, without the game, without the craft, like there's no broadcasters. So, so for you, can you hit a couple of the jobs that you've had that have led you to where you're going to be on Saturday night in prime time when the Oregon Ducks kick off their season? Well, I just named a couple of them. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, doing um, the the minor league team was the Fresno Grizzlies, the Giants AAA team, San Francisco Giants AAA team. So they had some good players, Madison Bumgarner and Buster Posey. And right. um, I did uh, before that. I you know the my first. When I got to Fresno State, I was doing a show uh, that was on like local TV. And then I was doing, um, I would do like high school football games on the radio. But then I would also produce some of the high school football games that were on a local TV station and the junior college basketball games. So I, um, yeah, that was an awesome experience, like getting to be in the truck and producing because because the person who was doing play by play was like the voice of high school football for ever in Fresno and Fresno is has Central California has great high school football. For people who don't know, it is. Uh, I'm not it's not the best high school football in the state, the north and the south still have of California still have the teams that win the championships for the most part every year, but it's, I would say having lived in northern California and Central California, you can tell me about Southern California. To me, Central California is the most kind of authentically small town football vibe that you get when you watch like high school football movies. That's Central California. Small towns, like really small towns. Um, Friday night's a big deal. Northern California, is, that's a pro sports town. Southern California is pro sports. You know, Central California, high school football really matters. So I did a lot of that and that was, it felt like a big deal. You know, you'd go do a high school football game at Clovis East or Clovis West or Sanger or Central or Kingsburg. And um, it was a big deal that the high school game of the week was there. Like it mattered. It didn't matter that the phone line would go down six times in the broadcast. Um, but that, but the, you know, that, so that stuff, like really having a, a touch uh directly to the audience was was fun um so you know pac network obviously where you and i met we did a lot of a lot of work there some of it together um but basketball and a lot of football and um gosh i'm forgetting so much stuff it's uh yeah a lot a lot of stuff that uh definitely probably felt like love of the game <laughs> You're yeah. like, how do you get, how are you going to get from here to there? <laughs> and there's, you know, luck mostly, yeah. I would say. There's a lot of that, uh, but there's also talent, which you clearly are. Uh, when you found out you were going to join the Big Ten Network and get a full game package, uh, where were you? What's the story behind when you learned? And, <laughs> and did you take a minute by yourself and be like, man, from Arena 2 to Power 4 football in the Big Ten as they expand as a it was a pretty fun path. Yeah, uh, I was right here at my desk. Um, I was doing a, a podcast, and I saw the phone ring. I saw the name, and I was like, oh, I better get off this podcast fast. It went to voicemail. <laughs> so there was like eight, you know, probably like seven minutes where I was like, oh, my God, my God, my God. And for me, like, it was a flashback. I Several years ago, I was, up, I was a finalist for a job that I was on radio when they called. I'd gone like, you know, do a couple auditions, that sort of thing. And, and it was a big job. And I was on radio. So it was on voicemail that I heard that I did not get the job, right? For whatever reason, this time I felt, I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, this is good. This is good. Um, but it was, there was like six minutes there, seven minutes where I was just like, oh my God, get, wrap this up and let's listen to this voicemail real quick. Um, yeah, it was... Um, I thought about that a long time, you know, get for people who get in a football packet. I've done football. I've tried to explain this to like friends of mine who don't work in our industry. Right. And it's like, like, well, you've been doing football games. I'd say, yeah, but it, it was, it was not exactly the same as 
hey, here's your crew, here's your analyst, here's your sideline reporter, here's your producer, here's your director. It's going to be a crew of 12 to 15 people, the same every week, which is the best part of doing television is being on the team. I mean, it really is. There's so much that goes into it when you watch a game that when it goes well, it's it's like a play working, right? It's 11 people pulling on the same rope, all those cliches. But it's true. Like sometimes I watch some some football plays, a deep ball, some quarterback hits a deep ball. And you're like, look at all the things that had to go right for that ball to land exactly in the right spot. And I got to catch it and that to be a touchdown. I mean, it is it's crazy. I understand. I really do feel like I have some understanding of why coaches are the way they are because if you really watch film and not i don't i watch it but not like a real analyst like yogi like you you just see all the things that go wrong and go right when you go to a practice you see every little thing that can go wrong and go right and that's you know what we do is kind of that way too the whole crew can do something right and i can screw it up right or i can have what i thought was this great moment but it, it, the whole thing doesn't work if everybody's not hitting it out of the park so it's so cliche and it's like i don't want to it sometimes it can sound i think a little um insincere we'll be like oh the, the crew but it's it is equal parts everybody and the whole thing has to be in sync or it doesn't it doesn't work but then it works it feels like it's flushing a driver or when you hit the ball you know when you baseball when you hit it right on the barrel or when you drink swish a jumper and pick up it just it's exactly what you've been trying to do. So anyway, I had all of those feelings, I think, kind of feeling like. And then, but then, you know, the next thing that happens, Yogi, immediately is like, oh, well, now I have to actually go just, I have to earn it. Mm. You know, after you get it is when you then have to earn it. Um, mm. I mean, you feel like you earned it up front, but no, that's someone's taking a chance on you. Now you got to earn it. So how do you navigate that? Because I bet a lot of young broadcasters who are going to listen to this and have tracked your career may feel that when they get their shot to call Oregon Duck Student Radio or USC or maybe get their shot in another network. Um, there's a navigation around that. I'm curious how you would, you approach it. It's, I mean, you just can't, you cannot skip steps. It's, it's, you cannot be the person that has the experience that can handle the situation that goes sideways until you've done it. Um, so the thing that everyone told me that I was always annoyed, like, oh, you just say I need more reps. Like, no, it's true. That's actually exactly that. It's it's true. I would have loved to have had, you know, 10 years ago, you would have loved that job. I wouldn't have been as good, though. I wouldn't have been as ready. Um, so there's a fine line between figuring out how to treat your rep like it's the Super Bowl, but without actually, most reps are not the Super Bowl. So if 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 it sounds to everybody like you're doing the Super Bowl, you're, you're actually doing the wrong thing. So it's a fine line. I, to me, there are a couple things that really, you know, there's different things that happen over the course of those of your experiences that crystallize and lead to something else. One was working with you and you told me about this quarterback thing you have called pace plays after critical errors. You know, like a quarterback throws an incompletion or a pick. What does he do next? Play after critical error. So that that was one thing in my mind, right? But the the other thing that goes hand in hand with that is, I'm I'm not a good golfer. Uh, I don't think it's interesting when most people talk about their golf game. So I'm not about to do that. But one thing golf being bad at golf taught me was that if you start a round of golf, trying today is the day I'm going to shoot the best score ever, or today is the day I do a perfect broadcast. That is not the way to approach that. I mean, it doesn't mean you're not striving for that, but that is not the way to approach anything you do. I don't think, I think it sets you up to need to then have the right mindset when you make a critical error. Um, it's when you're not hunting it, that it all kind of comes together. And then you learn that like the imperfections are the things that create moments where you can kind of shine. Um, so that's what I would, I mean, it's, that's what I would tell people. It's like prepare really well. And the biggest thing for me was learning that the preparation was just about freeing myself up for when the game started. You know, it wasn't about using all of that preparation in the game. One of my favorite things to talk to people about for high performers like yourself or, you know, those that are actually playing in the sport is it, what's your pre-performance routine? Like, do you have one? Like, do I need to make sure you have like a double latte? And, uh, you know, Ted, Ted Robinson used to tell a story like Keith Jackson wanted like a, uh, I think it was like a, 
orange soda or something like that when he's his PA back so in the day. And, and he got yelled at when he didn't bring, he brought too much ice or something like that. But whether there's something, you know, fun like that, like, yeah, I like a warm cup of coffee, for instance. Uh, but I also have a real diligent pre-performance routine. Uh, I'm curious for you in terms of your preparation and, and maybe take people into the weeds a little bit on the broadcast as we kick this thing off in a couple of days. I worked with a guy the last few years who, when he was young, his job was to, was to pour the whiskey in the fourth, or, or was it vodka, in the fourth quarter of Monday Night Football for Don Meredith, Frank Gifford, and Howard Cosell. Was wow. Job. He was like 19 years old. He was job to pour the vodka in the fourth quarter. Um, I've got a little bit of a new routine this year just because I had vocal cord surgery this offseason. A little offseason surgery. Yeah, you did. Yeah. And, uh, and so I've got um, – I don't have it here. I've got a uh, – uh, uh, it's basically like a nebulizer. It, it hydrates – it, it, it breaks the um, the uh, the water molecules into smaller uh, molecules than a regular like uh, 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 what's the thing you put in like a kid's room to make the air humidifier a humidifier yeah, so that your vocal cords can absorb it when you're like you know hotel rooms you sleep and it's dry so that's that's added to the um, to the to the routine this year and then some uh, vocal cord warm ups which I've never done before. Uh, those have been um, prescribed to me by my vocal coach. Those have been, uh, those are being added to the, uh, to the routine this year. And then the biggest thing, not the biggest thing. The other thing is I just try to, I just try to wrap through names as quick as possible, right? Like seven Roth, eight Thornby, right? Like you never memorize them all, but it's just, if I can know who's who, it, it just it gets me through the play faster. It gets the ball to you faster. It gets the ball back to me faster. You just kind of stay ahead. And, and then that's when things can really flow. So I don't, you know, probably try to get a probably won't be joining you for hot yoga on Saturday mornings. <laughs> hey, that's OK, man. That's okay. I appreciate that's ways. part of you. I wish that was part of my routine. I'm too. I'm uh, yeah. I mean, it's good to try and loosen up, but I'm also a little I need to like be watching the college football pregames and like know what what. It, what did Dave say? What did Ashley say on the BTN pregame? What did they? Oh, did you, and then it comes back and it always wor- It always comes back. Always in the third quarter, like yo, well, you saw what Dave said this morning on uh, the BTN on pregame, right? He said it was Michigan. They're gonna both quarterbacks are gonna get snaps today. I just made that up, but so it's just to watch stuff and kind of yeah, go over my notes. That's the biggest thing. Go over when I get down in the booth, I take my big spotting board and I'm going through it, highlighting. I'm just filtering. Right. Like it's just about, okay, everything's on here. I'm not going to use what are the high level things I need from this. So the whole week is about filtering and distilling and distilling and distilling and distilling. And then that's what I'll do next to you in the booth on when Saturdays, you, kind of distill some more. Or I guess maybe when or how did you develop the confidence to know when to kind of turn it off? Like there's a nowadays, I remember talking to Holly Rowe about this years ago. She does sideline um, for the biggest game in the country every weekend. And she would say, like, there's always something. Like, somebody's Instagram page, did I not see this? Did I not read that? Yeah. And she said she got to a point, I'm going to paraphrase here, because it was incredible advice. She said at some point she had to realize that on the field for her or us up in the booth, uh, we are, our job is to take people to a place they can't be especially down on the sidelines. So yes, I can have every pre-produced story and this kid did this on the social media and this kid accomplished that. Um, but at some point you have to say like, I'm going to tell you what actually is happening that you don't know about. And I thought that was really cool. And it unlocked me a little bit of saying, okay, come like Wednesday night. I'm going to go hang out with my kids. I'm going to hang out with my wife. Uh, the hay is in the barn and everything from here on out is bonus. And then you get to your coach's meetings on Friday and you go to practice and like you're adding to it but never feeling as though like I have to read or watch every YouTube video or every article written, you know, by, you know, the beat writers of the respective teams. And, and that took a while, I think, for me to kind of garner that type of confidence. I'm curious for you where, you where you net out around like when to stay, when to say stop so you can then be at your best and at your peak when the lights go on. It's hard. I mean, if there were nine days in a week, we'd stay, we'd spend nine days preparing yeah. for the game. Right. Like that's where I'm when you're going on the hike, I'm in the hotel, like, oh but it's like, I don't know, what am I doing? Just making myself feel better? Or I'm actually getting something accomplished. Right. Um for me it was a couple of things. It was one seeing other guys who do it at a high level. I used to take a lot of pride. I should have brought a board here. I have a small version of it. 
Um, but like I went to Oregon practice the other day and I took out a mini, this is a mini version of my board, right? Offense, defense. And um, I used to take like a lot of pride, like, oh, I'm going to have so much stuff on here. It made, it made me feel good. Not, it just like, I thought it made me think I was prepared that I had all this stuff written down. But then the game would happen and I couldn't use, I, it was just too much. It was like flipping through an encyclopedia. It didn't, it wasn't helpful. So first need, like I just needed to filter it and pare it down. Less was actually more. You're paralyzing yourself. Mm -hmm. And then it was seeing other people do it at a high level with less on their board, quote unquote, than I had. And yet they were doing it really well. It was very conversational. And I've always strived like, that was if I think about what are the things that I want a broadcast I'm involved with to be, I do want it to be conversational. That's what everybody wants. Easy to, easy to consume, right? Digestible. And several years ago, uh, I, I didn't really have much work in the summer. And um, my, I have a, a good friend of mine named Aaron Goldsmith, who is one of the Mariners broadcasters and did huge games for Fox uh, for several years, football, uh, college football and, and baseball. And he said, Hey, would you want to come do like, be my kind of stats guy for four MLB games? It was like, you know, four Saturdays, whatever. He's like, you can come hang. We'll go to, you know, we'll, we'll hang out. We'll have steak dinners and whatever. And I was like, yeah, actually I, I would love to do that because I never get to see, we, you never get to see another person in your role. There's only one of you at every game. So I never get to work with another play-by-play -play person. I never, you know what I mean? Like I just, I never got to see how somebody else's brain thinks. And I've gone into other booths and, but if you're not wearing that headset, you don't hear what the producer's saying. You know, it's, it's not. And he was working with a really high level crew, right? It'd be like John Smoltz or AJ Prasinski and the producer with the highest level producers and Pete Machesky. Like, and so I got to just be around these people, this crew that was operating at the highest level. And I got to see his brain and i also got to see how i could contribute to him in the same way that our statistician or spotter contributes to me when i'm in the other chair it's really valuable to have somebody who can be ready with a note card that says here comes yogi roth out of the bullpen he's blown four straight saves like oh, let's probably get yogi out of there but so it was really valuable to see like okay this is yeah I, i'm seeing it now from this other view and it just kind of clarified some things for me. It's just how do people take notes? I mean, it's really the simple stuff that if you sat me down with the five best play-by-play -play people in the world, I would not ask them their favorite, like, what was your favorite story at the best stadium? I'd want to know, like, how do you take notes? Yeah, totally. Every time, like once every month, NBC will have a shot in their booth from behind of Tariko and Collinsworth. And you can get a glimpse of Tariko's. I'm like, I, I, and I'll screenshot it. And I've got the screenshots. I'll send them to buddies or other like static guys or spotters that I know and be like, what's happening here, you think? Because you'll see like a monitor and then a, and I'm like, I, I, that's all I want. Like, Mike, what, explain your situation here to me. Because how can I be better? It's just really, I, I don't know. I love that stuff. But anyway, it was just seeing it from another point of view that really helped me. That's cool. All right, three more. We'll get you out of here. Uh, we got a game this weekend. We got the Ducks. Uh, against Idaho, and then next week we got USC and Utah State, two teams uh, on the West Coast, clearly a part of the Big Ten now, one team a favorite, you could argue, for the national championship. I think somebody on game day might have picked them to win it. I don't re recall necessarily if it was Nick Saban or Herb Street or whomever. In, in addition, you got USC, who... I think it was Herbie. Uh, Herbie, okay. I SC, I, I know Saban was high on them, and it felt like that just flipped the narrative from other people that are on, on TV. Uh, for you and these two teams, because this podcast is all about college football through the lens of the West Coast, what do you think people don't know about either one of these programs that you plan on sharing, celebrating, elevating a little bit around the stories of these two programs? Or programs, I should say. Programs, yeah, thank you. Um, I, you know, what do people not know about Oregon? Uh, I, I think what's going to be really cool about that week one is just kind of not that they haven't been on national television, but they haven't been on ABC. Of course they have, but showing kind of what that stadium atmosphere is like, and students aren't in yet, but I think they'll still have a really good crowd showing that environment from elite, like they, they are part of this thing now. Right. So it kind of feels like I, 
I think it's so cool that we get to do these two games because it feels like, even though certainly people in other parts of the country, they've watched Oregon games before, but now they're part of the same league. And it's almost like we get to kind of tour guide them. Mm. It's not to say we're going to tell people all this stuff they don't know, but that part to me feels really cool. It's like, hey, Oregon is part of this other thing now. You guys are part of, this is part of you now. You know, and the same for SC. Um, but Southern California has been on display every year. This is not, you know, they don't play in the Rose Bowl, but palm trees, like everyone's seen palm trees on a big stage. Eugene's very college town, right? In the best possible way. So I think that's the thing that's cool. I mean, the movement of Dan Lanning from being a national championship assistant coach at Georgia, being a Broyles Award finalist twice, to being Oregon's head coach, that helps Oregon's profile. Dylan Gabriel, who everybody knows, right? He's at Oklahoma, being Oregon's quarterback. Bo, it's the same thing. Bo Nick, like Oregon became a national talking point for a lot of reasons in the last few years. One was they were really good. But another one was, and everybody had an opinion of Bo Nix in the nation before he showed up at Oregon. That was really valuable. And the same for Caleb Williams and, and USC and Lincoln and USC. So it's like the games are great. The games are the best thing. The games are the biggest thing. But in terms of getting people engaged, having quote unquote characters that they're already familiar with is really valuable. It really helped the Pac-12, I thought. Michael Penix and K Michael Penix, especially the same thing. Like everybody had an opinion on him coming at it, Indiana. So it really helped the profile of the West Coast the last several years. Chip going to UCLA. Um, so, you know, there are people in Oklahoma that know Dylan Gabriel better than I know Dylan Gabriel. But there's a new version of Dylan Gabriel now. Yeah. He's, he's the Oregon quarterback. And so we get to show that one. And he's the guy that's so proud of being from Hawaii and wearing number eight. And, like, who Dan Lanning is telling him, like, man, you got to speak up. You got eight months here. We're trying to win a championship, you know. I think that's the thing with Oregon is Dan Lanning is building something so sustainable and so big. But also, how many shots do you get to really be like one of the top three teams with a chance to win the national championship and a quarterback as good as Dylan Gabriel and a team is physically ready, you know? Uh, and if Dan Lanning wins a championship, you know, when you win one, I think historically in the first three years of being a head coach, it can really change your, not change, just supercharge your trajectory. And then SC, like, is Miller, to me, the big story, one of them as I see it is, is Miller, he might be a top four quarterback in the Big Ten. I think, I don't know. We all get to see this for the first time. Um, but he's very different than what Lincoln had in Caleb. But look at what Lincoln's done with, with quarterbacks, right? So um, that's it. Can they stop the, how much better do they have to be on defense? I thought Dan Lynn was an NFL coordinator candidate last year. He was. So is he the next head coach uh, somewhere? So can they be, you know, I, the guy I think of, you remember what Jim Levitt did when he got to Colorado and then when he got to Oregon? He took oh, yeah. those defenses. It was year by year. I don't remember the, but it was like 125th to 85th to 55th to, to 15th, right? It was like bam, 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 bam. Can Dan Lynn do that this year at SC to me? Is I just, no these doubt. are such huge national stories, man. It's so great. You know, Lincoln Riley said something to us. We were there for our Big Ten training camp show, and, I, and I'll never forget it because it was spot on. You, you referenced it a minute ago talking about Oregon. But he said he talked to his staff and was like, he had to remind them, he said, of like, you don't get an unlimited amount of chances mm. at leading a program like Oregon or USC or any team, really, as a head coach, as a staff, as the collective unit of 120 players. He's like, we get one shot at this thing. Like, we got to go for it. And I just think that is echoed so much. It was, it was echoed earlier this week in my conversation with Pete Carroll on this podcast of like, the best teams cut it loose. They got to go for it. So uh, before we cut you loose, I got to ask this one. Uh, I'm your partner. Rhett is a partner. And we got Denny Blunt, dad of two. Congratulations to our producer. Oh, what do you believe? Like what matters most for you in each one of those roles as producer, sideline analyst, and booth analyst? I was having a debate with, uh, with a couple people. We had some meetings a few, uh, like three weeks ago. And I, I don't remember, I think you were standing there. I don't know if you stayed for this because it was offensive to you as an analyst, but we were, me and a, another play-by-play uh, -play guy, I said that it was Connor Onion who's doing games with, with Helfrich this year. I was like, 
if we had to, if it was like college football, you know, you build a, build a player or a video game, you know, it's like 80% speed, 90% arm, but you can't, I said, what, how low are you willing to go on your analyst <laughs> to get like a 95 producer, you know, <laughs> that was, that was our big debate. Uh, um, what was your answer? Are you like low? Uh, Give me no, it low. was all over the place, right? It was like, are you willing to take a C analyst and an A producer? Would you rather have two Bs? Would you rather have? Um, I don't even remember how how that discussion wrapped up, but uh, you'd rather have A's across the board, which is what I've got. Um, you know, Rhett is our sideline reporter. Rhett is, I don't know how far are we from the field. We're a long way from the field. Rhett is on the field. He's the only guy on the field with a microphone other than the head referee, right? Those are the two people that have a microphone on the field. So he gets to, I've done that role. I think you've done that role. It's awesome. You get to read, you get to hear what people say to each other. You get to read their lips up close. You get to see things happening. So, I mean, that's the role, right? Like he'll go in with a bunch of ideas of things he wants to say, and then the game happens. And there might be 10 things that happen on the field that for all the cameras you have in the world, like you, there's still things the human gets to see right there behind the bench. So he gets to have a view that nobody else gets to have you. You're the expert. Like my job is to make sure that I don't get in the way of you telling the viewer why things are happening. There are 22 people on the field on every play. All of them have a job to do the percentage of time they do the right job. I don't know, but it's really complicated. You know, it's really simple. But it's really complicated. It's really simple. And people, you know, it's just, it's a game of force and, and desire. That's true. But it's also really complicated. So I think that's cool to like see it happen and to see somebody like you who can really understand it quickly and communicate it quickly. And then the producer, man, is like, the producer is just, I'm not going to say the most unsung because I think people who do, who work in this business understand how valuable a great producer is. But a producer can, uh, producer makes or breaks the whole thing, like changes the whole vibe, the energy. The producer guides the whole thing on the fly, um, understands what direction to drive it in, understands when to direct us or to, in my ear, say, hey, what about, should they be going for two here? Or maybe not to say anything. Like the producer is handling a whole truck of really talented people who are saying, hey, I think we could get this in, or I got this graphic right now, or what about, you want this replay? Which replay angle do you want? As the director's changing camera angles, as Rhett's in his ear saying, I got something here, as Yogi's in talkback going, hey, give me that, let me get that again, let me get that again, as I'm going off on some other thing. As we told you earlier today, take a look at this graph. So like producers, I could not, without a doubt, do that job. At, at the level that, the, I could do it with three cameras and I could not do it at this level, right? It's just, I am fascinated by producers. I would, I would love to be in a, the way they work. It's just, it's, I think so high pressure and their job is to sound really calm in our ears because you know, we're the talent and we can't be bothered. Don't inconvenience me. Don't yell too loud. Right. That's what I'll be doing. Before the game. Like, yeah. Can I get a little less of Denny, a little more of Yogi, a little less of Denny, a little less of Denny, little, little, little more of me, please. A little more. Yeah, there you go. There you you go. know, it's just, Sometimes we get in it, we think we're high performance athletes and the producer's job is to make us allow us to feel that way. Right. Yeah. But still direct the whole thing. I, so anyway, everybody's got, and we're not, that's, what is that? Four people. There's so many more. Yeah. You're exactly right. I think my favorite part of a it's game 8% day, of the crew. Yeah. A favorite part of game day is meeting with the camera crew a couple hours before the game, just sharing, like, you're going to see stuff that I don't see. And there's nothing better in a broadcast when like the low end zone's like, I saw that hand signal that the X receiver gave to the boundary. Yeah. And that means a fade. And it's like, fade is coming. You circle the guy and it's a touchdown and everything worked. Um, so you're right. It, it is a beautiful environment. I think, you know, in closing here, guy like playing is the coolest thing ever, right? Whether you were shooting jump shots. And by the way, guys, a pretty good jump shot. I saw him in my backyard a couple weeks ago. Oh, uh, whether, you're, whether you're hooping, uh, whether you're playing football, I think the next closest thing is coaching because you really feel a locker room and feel a growth of a team. And then the, the, the next best thing I think is broadcasting. I really do. And I think that the, the really healthy crews, the really uh, high achieving groups, they feel as though they're a team. You know, there, there's yeah. people that do a ton of crazy stuff during the week, right? They'll be calling a basketball game, they'll be producing a game show, uh, you, you name it. I mean, everybody's working a bunch of different angles, right? I'm hosting a podcast, whatever. Um, you do that as well. 
but to come together on Saturdays in front of this arena of 60, 70, 80, 100,000 fans, let alone a couple million on television, it's awesome. Like it's such a beautiful connection among the group. Can you share with people, can I ask you a question? We're probably sure. over time. Why not? Yeah, we're over, but sorry. We, Jim, Jim Thorne is a great producer. Go ahead. Uh, can you, I get asked this question a lot and I, I give people, I think I know the answer sometimes, but not every time. But I get asked this question a lot. It's like, how does your analyst know before the replay, as the replay is airing on TV, right? Big running back breaks off through, through the B gap uh, for 15 yards. And the analyst immediately says, all right, I want you to watch 55 right here. He's going to hold this block. And people ask, how does the guy know? He hasn't even seen the replay yet. Is he, does he see the game that well? What's your answer to that? How do you know? Yeah, I, I think, you know, as you referenced earlier, you love talking to other broadcasters. I, I do as well. Uh, you know, I, I really think, at least in my experience, it's the only one I have, coaching at SC for four years allowed me to view the game differently. Why? Well, for two years, I sat up in the press box for every game next to Lane Kiffin as he called plays. My job was to mm -hmm. read coverages. What front is happening? What was the blitz? And did we run the right route? What was the combination? Not really quarterback play. Like I didn't, I wasn't watching the pocket. I wasn't watching the throw. I was watching everything else. And then I did two more years down on the field where I was singling in the plays and, and really I was a quarterback coach then. So you're really dialed on that and you're trying to dictate as they're making a check at the line of scrimmage on which way to run it. It's based on the alignment of an interior defensive tackle. That's hard to see anywhere, let alone down on the field. But I, I was trained by Steve Sarkeesian really how to see it. So I, I think that that was like one of my greatest feathers in my, analyst hat if you will of i was coached on how to see the game so when i look at it from the top like i'm always going from a couple different angles one is i'm like i'm playing i'm playing the game sometimes like if it's a two minute drive like look out get out the way guy because i'm going to be predicting it's quarterback play it's how do we have to navigate this situation other moments in the game uh i'm saying all right let me play linebacker right here or if i'm the defense i'm calling this and you're trying to predict it pre-snap and then see if it comes through and then I think the other stuff is, is where you get confident where you just trust it. Like I've seen enough, call it power plays, where I know it's going to be down, down, backside pull. And you just can kind of feel it. So to your point of like studying the roster, you're just kind of in your head. You're like, all right, that's 55. He started at left guard. Or before the series, I'm asking the spotter, hey, what's the offensive line in this game? Because I know they're going to might rotate a couple players. And, and then you just got to trust it. And, and that to me has been the, probably the biggest growth in my last five years of like, I'm a walk on preparer, over preparer by trade. But I think you get to the point, and, and if you ask me like what matters most to me, uh, it's really the game. So, and, and by that, I mean letting the game unfold. So I might think they're gonna do this or anticipate they're gonna do that, but if they don't, I don't hold on to it anymore. You know, like it's like, yeah. okay, cool. Like, yeah. like my, my board is stacked with info. And, I, and it's just a place for me to put everything I learn. I read it once Friday night, read it once Saturday morning, read it once at the stadium. Then I'm barely looking at it the rest of the game, unless I'm I, writing a note on it. And that I've looked at your board a lot. I can't figure it out. I haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> That's all right. Well, I, my first broadcast, I remember calling Dave Sims, who now does the Mariners, yeah. and called our games back in the Big East on ESPN for a while. And I got my first break. Hey, I'm now. Calling, yeah, I'm calling That's games at Fox no. College Sports. I think it was my first game was oh. Kansas, North Dakota State. It was an upset. And I remember being like, what's a board? And he's <laughs> okay, you want to buy this big poster board? And you write all these things on it. And I bought one. And I'm in yeah, my yeah. little studio apartment yeah, yeah, on the floor. Yeah. And I'm like, my handwriting sucks. What am I doing? I come from coaching where you typed everything into a call mm. sheet. So I'm like, I'm going to do it like it makes sense to me. Yeah. So. That's good. That's I'm not, fine. I'm not, not, if that's not supposed to make sense to me, I'm not knocking it. I just haven't figured your brain out totally yet. Yeah. Well, you know what? That's why we got this whole season to do, baby. We're just going to dial it in. Guy Haberman, my partner, um, on a serious note, guy, I'm so, I'm so honored to be on your team, be a part of our team. Uh, I've been gifted really special play by play people throughout my career. The totality of Steve Fiziak, mm. Kevin Calabro, mm. Ted Robinson. Mm. I've had sprinkles of you. JB Long mm -hmm. uh, and a couple others. Like I feel like the luckiest analyst in the world because I have people that love this craft and are selfless. And and I hope to I hope to echo that to a degree. And I think the coolest thing is being a part of something greater than yourself. And, and we get to do that 
in a matter of days. So you're on your way to Eugene. I'm going to go to Portland, get my yoga session in at Yo-Yo Yogi, get my favorite latte, and drive down and meet you. And we're going to hang out, man. Can't wait. I'm excited, there Yogs. Is. Here we there go. I didn't think is. this is weird. I didn't think the season would. We spent all this time talking about theoreticals. Now we got to we get to call the game. Yeah, we get to call the game. We get to, baby. What an opportunity. Check us out. Uh, 430 Pacific. Pacific. You Pacific got it. Prime. 730 Prime. Eastern. Just, you got to get used to talking in Eastern time now. I know this is through a West Coast lens, Yog. But. Yeah, yeah, we'll go there. I'm happy to do that. I grew up in Pennsylvania. 730 Eastern, 430 Pacific. Prime time. The Ducks and the Vandals. We got you covered. Seven ways to Sunday, man. We're going to talk about that team out West. The Oregon Ducks like and the that. Vandals of Idaho. Kenyon Sadiq. There's a bunch of those guys. You're going to know that name by the end of Saturday night. I promise you that. So that's Guy Haberman. Nogi Roth guy, lots of love, man. Travel safe.